Very good morning to you. Last week I did lecture the chapter 11, the theoretical methods for solving the volume sources and volume conductors. The last method was uh, Gaber Nelson theorem. Uh, the slides for this important theorem were not in the very best shape. Uh, I always, all the time, I improve my slides. It is a really, really huge task to take care of these slides and improve them. But I haven't had the opportunity to uh, make everything perfect. So during the last week, I improved this Gaber Nelson theorem much better. And therefore, I would like to lecture it once again, so that you can, so that I can demonstrate how much the slides are improving all the time, and I hope that you get better impression what is the Gaber Nelson theorem. Gaber Nelson theorem. The preconditions are: source is moving, equivalent dipole moment of a volume source and conductor is finite homogeneous. So the word moving don't necessarily need the source to move, but it means that with this theorem it is possible to locate the source. So it is a dipole source whose location is possible to find. And it is required that the conductor is finite and homogeneous. It must be finite to have a surface. The surface is essential. So this was uh, published in 1954 by Dennis Gaber and Clifford V. Nelson. Dennis Gaber is uh, or was a Hungarian scientist who received the Nobel Prize from holography. And Clifford Nelson actually is, his name originally is Nilsson. He's a Swedish a Swedish scientist who moved to the uh, United States. There was a biomedical engineering conference, an international conference in Finland in uh, 1980 something, 85, I, I'm not, don't remember exactly, 1980s. And I was uh, chairman uh, in one session and it happened to be that Clifford Nelson was the co-chairman in that session. So I met Mr. Nielsen. We start with the flux source density, which is I sub F equals to minus nabla dot J I. This is a definition which I have given you before. The resulting dipole moment of the flux source density is by definition P equals to integral V, volume integral R I sub F D V. This dipole moment has three components, the x, y, and z component, and we examine its x component, which was shown before, p sub x equals to integral x i sub f dv. And I did mention that there are several steps here, which I don't uh, go through in my lecture, but to prove that there are several steps, which you can find from the book, I just show that they are here, but I do not go through this steps. And finally we get for the p sub x that it equals to sigma integral phi d sub x. When we sum up the similar equations for p sub x, p sub y and p sub z, we obtain the Gabor Nelson theorem, the e Gabor Nelson equation, which is that p equals to sigma integral s v d s which is a very beautiful, simple equation. And I usually say that it is so simple that it is difficult to understand what it means. So let's go through. P is the equivalent dipole moment, yes. Sigma is the conductivity of the volume conductor. From the preconditions you did find that sigma is, uh, the conductivity is homogeneous, so it can be uh, taken outside the integral, it is homogeneous. 
V is uh, potential, S is surface, so it is a surface integral, and ds is a vectorial surface element. Very, very simple equation. What does it mean? How, how, do we, how should we understand it? Let's go to the details. The vectorial surface element is a vector on the surface, but the surface is divided to uh, uh, elemental areas and the length of the ds equals to element area and it is normal to the surface and I used to show this picture to in illustrate how the vectorial surface elements look like. Let's observe or go through this Graeber Nelson theorem. We have a volume conductor. Inside the volume conductor is a volume source and we observe or model it with its uh, equivalent dipole source, which we are going to find with the Gabor Nelson equation. This dipole moment generates a potential field on the surface of the volume conductor. It is, of course, most positive here in the direction of the dipole moment and most negative here. And we can draw isopotential surfaces in the volume conductor in, in somehow in this way. Then we divide the surface of the volume conductor to surface elements, S sub i. In this example, we have now divided them, I have divided them to uh, all together to uh, 11, 12 elements, number 12 is here, 12 elements, and I show this just in two dimensions, but of course it is in all three dimensions. Then we provide each surface element with the corresponding surface element vector, d sub s, d s sub, sorry, d s sub i, d s sub 1 to d s sub 12. And the surface element vectors, as I said before, their length equals to the surface area and orientation is normal to the surface. Now, this is not the Gaber Nelson theorem, but if we sum up these vectorial surface elements, their sum is zero. But that is not the, the, the Gaber Nelson process. In the Gaber Nelson process, we multiply <coughs> each surface element with the corresponding potential of the voltage, what is measured here, which changes the situation very different. You find that uh, the uh, ds1 is multiplied with a high value of voltage, or it is big voltage here, so that it comes long. Ds2 is multiplied with a smaller voltage, and Ds3 still smaller voltage. And here the potential changes its polarity. Ds4 is multiplied with a negative number, and so on, D, up to Ds9. Uh, uh, and then again we multiply with positive values. So the sum of these products of the uh, surface element and the voltage existing at location form a vector which is according to the Gabor Nelson theorem equal to the dipole moment of the volume source. This is the idea how to understand the Gabor Nelson theorem. Why it is so? The reason is that you have to go through the several equations, which I quickly did show you. So that is a theorem. Then finally, for the location of the equivalent dipole source, five equations are obtained, which I don't show here. I, could, I should make one more slide to show them. They are in the book. Three are needed to calculate the location of the dipole, 
and the other two may be used to check the accuracy of the solution. So this is the maximum what is obtained with surface measurements from the equivalent dipole source. If the volume conductor is homogeneous. If it is inhomogeneous, we also get the solution, but that is wrong. So this is the Gabor Nelson theorem story. I also did show the summary of the sources and conductors of these methods. I show this again. Uh, in forward problem, it was used uh, two methods, double uh, the, the solid angle theorem and miller geiselowitz model, which the latter one I did not show you. In the solid angle theorem, the source is double layer and the conductor is what I discussed, infinite homogeneous. I show it with a, with a uh, darker red. It is possible to use the theory also with other kind of conductors, but it is much more complicated and we are not interested in that. I just mentioned that in the miller gezelowitz model, the source is distributed dipole cellular basis and the conductor is finite homogeneous and other conductors may be also used, but I didn't discuss that. In the inverse problem, in solving the source, I did teach you the lead vector. Lead vector and image surface have the same preconditions. Source is a moment of a dipole in a fixed location. Note it is in a fixed location. And I discussed it, I did like it to discuss it with a finite homogeneous or inhomogeneous volume conductor, but the surface is not needed, so it equally well it holds with infinite conductors. Lead field. The main difference was for lead field that there is a wider variety of sources, mainly this dipole moment of the volume source. So it was possible to use the lead field to analyze volume sources. That is an important issue. Also could be used dipole moment of the double layer and of course uh, uh, moment of the dipole in the fixed location. Dipole moment of multiple dipole. I did not discuss the multipolar properties, but that is possible. Uh, 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 multiple dipole properties and multiple properties. I did not discuss, but they are applicable as well. But the main area of application is here the dark green. And then finally the Gabor Nelson theorem Essential in Gabor Nelson theorem is that the conductor must be finite, it must have the surface, and the accurate solution is obtained only if the conductor is homogeneous. The sources may be a double dipole moment of the double layer, moment of a dipole in a fixed location, dipole moment of the volume source, because it calculates the dipole moment. And this additional property, Gabor Nelson theorem gives the location of the dipole, so we can discuss the or analyze the moving dipole. It is from these methods, it is the only one which accurately gives the location. With lead field, we can uh, have an estimate or, or a good guess for the location of the dipole, and it is used very much. Uh, and the good guess is that most probably the source is there where the lead field is strongest or the measurement sensitivity is the best. But it, that's only a question of probability. It is not accurate. It is a good guess. But Gaber Nelson theorem, there is no guess. It is an absolutely correct solution for the location of the dipole equivalent dipole moment. That is, uh, that is uh, uh, the special property of Gabor Nelson theorem. So I hope Gabor Nelson theorem became more clear to you and it is worth of coming more clear because it is it's mathematically nice beautiful theorem.
And this I did like to show you very much, but let's go on. I go now to the next topic, which is uh, theory of biomagnetic measurements. Biomagnetism is uh, quite wide uh, discipline. It is quite widely applied. Uh, quite much money is invested to biomagnetism. And uh, what I want to show during this course is that uh, what do we get with biomagnetism? I have had the pleasure to find out the basic uh, uh, solutions for the basic fundamental issues of biomagnetism and I am proud to show them during these lectures. Let's start from the equations. Let's study first, very briefly, the biomagnetic field of a volume source in when the conductor is infinite homogeneous. So again we start from the uh, simplified situation. The simplified situation whether we don't uh, consider the uh, conductor's properties, we just assume that it is infinite homogeneous. And I give you this equation from the Stratton book when you start to teach this course, you certainly find more new uh, books of electromagnetic theory, but the equations are the same, of course. Current density J gives rise to a magnetic field 4 pi H equals to volume integral J cross nabla 1 over R dV. This is a general, no special bio, but general current uh, density gives a magnetic field. And when looking back to equation 7.5, which gave the solution for the electric field, you may compare these equations and find that the electric field was or is 4 pi sigma 5 equals to volume integral j dot nabla 1 over r dv. And what is special, what we find here is that the Otherwise, the equals equations are the same, except for magnetic field, there is a cross product here, and for electric field, here is a dot product. This is dominating. This goes through this theory. You find that in magnetic field, there is a cross product, and for electric field, there is a dot product. That is mathematically the difference. Let's go now to the realistic situation where the conductor is finite inhomogeneous. That's what we are. We are finite and we are inhomogeneous. When we substitute the equation 7.2, which tells what is the total current in the volume conductor, which is impressed current plus the returning current, to the equation 12.1, which I did give you in the first uh, previous slide, and dividing the finite inhomogeneous volume conductor to piecewise homogeneous volume conductor, which we made in the electric case as well, we get this equation finding that uh, when the J is uh, replaced with the Ji minus sigma nabla phi, from the first term comes here this uh, term, and from the second term comes this term, and Using vector identity, nabla cross phi a equals to phi nabla cross a plus nabla phi cross a. The integrand of the last term in the equation in the previous slide, the integrand here becomes sigma sub j nabla cross phi nabla 1 over r minus phi nabla cross nabla 1 over r. Since nabla cross nabla phi equals to zero, the last term, the whole term in equation 12.2 becomes to this form minus sum sub j integral v sub j sigma sub j nabla cross phi nabla 1 over r dv. So this comes this one. 
applying the vector identity in volume integral number cross C dV equals to minus surface integral C cross D as the last term in the equation 12.2 which was on the previous slide or it is here also becomes this one and applying this to the equation 12.2 we get from equation 12.2 finally equation 12.6 which was derived by David Gezelovich in 1970. So what does this equation do? It describes the magnetic field due to an uh, impressed current density distribution in a finite inhomogeneous volume conductor, which is modeled by piecewise homogeneous volume conductor. The pieces are divided or separated with surfaces as index J and the conductivity on both sides of the surface J are sigma double prime and sigma prime. Just similar equation as for the electric field. So let's have a look to the equations of the bioelectric and biomagnetic fields. The activating cells act as source elements with current density Ji, which produce two fields. So if we have here the heart, there is there exists current source current density Ji. Here are the uh, sources. They produce electric field and they produce magnetic field. If here is present some physicist, he or she could say that no, it generates an electromagnetic field, not separate electric and magnetic fields. Yes, I agree with that. It is an electromagnetic field. But because we are discussing and observing the electromagnetic field in the near field, close, relatively close to the source, and because the frequency is so low, we can uh, well accept that we speak of two separate fields, the electric field and the magnetic field. The equations of the electric and magnetic fields have two terms, which represent the contributions of the source and the conductor. I did show you earlier this equation which describes the uh, electric field due to the impressed current source density Ji in a finite inhomogeneous volume conductor which is modeled with a piecewise homogeneous volume conductor. This I did show you earlier. And I just now did show you the corresponding magnetic field. And I draw your attention to this beautiful mathematical property or issue. These equations are otherwise identical except in electric field equation we find here are dot products and for magnetic field here are cross products. That is mathematically the difference and it's very beautiful when they are otherwise similar. David Gezelovich, whom I personally know, who is a very highly appreciated uh, theoretician, who derived or published first, first, first to first publish the equations for these electric and magnetic fields, published them in these forms. He published the equation for the electric field in 1967 and three years later the equation for the magnetic field. These are correct forms, correct forms these equations. But from these equations you do not immediately see 
the beauty of the equations, the, the, sim the similarity between uh, electric and magnetic fields. So with the Robert Plonsi, we did sit down and work these equations uh, mathematically equal, of course, but just uh, manipulating the terms to these forms, which I did show you, which are these equals, equations are mathematically equal, and these equations are mathematically equal. But now you see what I did point out before, the beauty of the theory that the only difference between these equations is their dot and cross product. Paul Dirac, who was a, was a British physicist who received the Nobel Prize, once again a Nobel Prize in physics for the discovery of new productive forms of atomic theory, the Dirac delta function. Paul Dirac visited Soviet Union and he was asked to lecture on the philosophy of physics. And he wrote on the blackboard, the laws of nature should be expressed in beautiful equations. I agree with this. So the beautiful equations are the equations for the bioelectric and biomagnetic field. When they are given in those forms which we work with Bob Plonsi, it's beautiful. Whichever you think is beautiful, but I think that was beautiful. What kind of are the biomagnetic sources and biomagnetic fields? I just summarize what kind of fields they are. Here is a graph where on the horizontal axis is shown the frequency of the magnetic field or flux density. Here is uh, 1 hertz, uh, 10, 100 and so on. And on the vertical axis is a max magnetic flux density in Teslas. The static field of the Earth, the field which is orienting the compass needle, for instance, the static field of the uh, Earth is here. And then please note that they are missing three orders of magnitude, 10 to minus 4 and 10 to minus 7. And we go down to the nano Teslas picoteslas and femtoteslas. The biomagnetic fields are here. The strongest biomagnetic field is the magnetocardiogram, the magnetic field produced by the beating heart. You find that, of course, the dominate, that is a spectra, the dominating frequency is one hertz, of course, that is the, just the heart beating frequency. And uh, it is in the Picotesla region. It is in Picoteslas. Magnetoencephalography, uh, or, or magnetoencephalogram, which is the magnetic field of the brain, is much weaker, much weaker. And this is the alpha wave frequency here is a dominating. And you find that it is a one or two orders of magnitude smaller than magnetocardiogram. Here is magnetooculogram, not so very important. It is just as an example that moving the eye gives that kind of signal or that spectrum. And magnetomyogram is coming from the, from the muscles uh, activity. Just to get an impression uh, what they are, these fields uh, in relation to, to the environment, it is shown here that the geomagnetic noise is typically here. There's nothing static and constant in the world. The Earth's static magnetic field is not static. It has fluctuations all the time. And that is the frequency band of the fluctuations of the geostatic, geo, geomagnetic field. Here is shown the laboratory noise for the low noise and high noise laboratories. It means that if you take here a sensitive magnetometer and measure the signal in this room, there is that kind of uh, field spectra, something like that. And there is, of course, the dominating noise coming from the line frequency, 50 hertz, and its harmonics. And from where these come? They come typically if there's... Uh, one, one car is driving by here, 
uh, close to the room. Uh, it has a lot of ferromagnetic uh, material, iron in the car, and when it is moving in the uh, quite strong static field of the Earth, it is of course changing the field uh, distribution also in this room. Uh, if uh, someone is uh, moving a chair in, in the next floor, chair or, or table which has uh, iron legs, the, it changes the field and so on and so on. So that is the laboratory noise typically. And here is radio frequency noise coming from the radio transmitters. Uh, that is typically so. So what you see from here is that the, okay, and there's still one uh, level shown which is a magnetic noise of brain. In magnetoencephalography it is important. So there's magnetic noise coming from the body also. So what you see from this graph is that the biomagnetic fields are really physically very weak and they are much weaker than the noise surrounding here the uh, laboratory. So that makes a challenge for the measurement of the, the signals. What kind of instruments are used for measurement? As I said in the, f in the first lecture, I do not speak too much about the instrumentation in this course, but this is a special field. I, I like to say something about the biomagnetic instrumentation. Uh, here is an induction coil magnetometer. I have another picture. This is the noise field or the noise level of the induction coil magnetometer when the copper wire is, uh, is wound on, on, on a coil in room temperature. This is the world's most sensitive induction coil magnetometer which, that we constructed in Tampere. You find that it is just about sensitive enough for detecting magnetocardiogram, but not for magnetoencephalogram. Here is a so-called squid magnetometer. Squid does not mean the octopus, the animal. No, it means superconducting quantum interference device. So it is a, a, a superconducting a, a device which is operating in superconducting temperature, which is the liquid helium plus 4 Kelvin uh, minus uh, uh, 269 degrees centigrade. Uh, the superconductivity is needed for the operation of the squid sensor. In addition, because it is in so low temperature, the thermal noise is minimal. It is a squid detector which is used in biomagnetic measurements. The induction coil was just in the first, first experiments, but it does not have any, any uh, meaning or use anymore. There's a thermal noise of the current shield and, and the thermal noise of the body. So you see that it is challenging, very challenging to measure the biomagnetic fields and also it means that it is very expensive to do the measurements because the si signals are so low. Uh, just show here the same, same thing uh, with the same graph. Here is shown the profile of the coil which we designed, there was some, some invention here to get it so sensitive and that is uh, the induction coil magnetometer noise level. And here is uh, a squid magnetometer which we had at Tampere, so that's, that's a technical issue. And this is summary of those noises, it is not so important here. Just have a look how they look like. Here is a vectorial magnetometer induction coil, just uh, copper wire wound a uh, large number of turns and its uh, noise level is here and that is a squid magnetometer in, in the superconducting uh, liqu uh, uh, liquid helium and its sensitivity uh, is here. Okay, that was the instrumentation. Let us go to the magnetic uh, field detection theory. I start here again like in the electric case from uh, the principle of reciprocity approach. I show you here a theoretically fundamental magnetic lead. 
similarly as the, in the electric case. Here is a volume conductor in different way to show it. Here are detectors which are called magnodes. In electric case they were electrodes connected with a wire and typical or characteristic for these magnodes are that they are constructed from the material which has infinite magnetic permeability. In electric case the electrodes had infinite electric conductivity. Here is a coil around this core or wire and magnetic flux flowing here induces to this coil a voltage which is the signal which we get from the magnetic biomagnetic source. According to the principle of reciprocity to find out what is the measurement uh, sensitivity distribution of this magnetic lead, we feed a reciprocal current to here to this detector, uh, to, the, to the lead where the detection is made, a unit current. But because this arrangement is not superconducting, we cannot feed a DC current, one ampere we feed a current whose uh, time der derivative is unit, so it is one ampere per second. So now you can forget this, we just feed a reciprocal current. Reciprocal current feeding to this lead raises here several different fields. Firstly, it raises a magnetic scalar potential field, phi sub Lm. L means lead and M means magnetic. Phi is a scalar pot magnetic scalar potential. As a negative gradient of this phi sub L M is a magnetic field H sub L M, which looks like that. And multiplying it with the uh, existing magnetic permeability mu, we get the magnetic field, the magnetic induction B. Here is now an, a very important issue, which is, I show it very soon again, but if you remember the picture on the electric lead, if these magnodes in this magnetic lead are geometrically identical to the electrodes in the electric lead, then this magnetic scalar potential field is geometrically identical to the electric scalar potential field and therefore of course the magnetic field shown here is geometrically identical to the electric field in the electric case. This magnetic field induces in this region an electric field which is R cross B divided by 2. So this is the direction of an electric field, what it induces. So it finally induces this kind of tangential rotating electric field, which is the reciprocal electric field. Because the conductivity sigma, this raises a current field, which has of course geometrically the identical form than the electric field. Now, this current field, J sub Lm, is the lead field or the measurement sensitivity distribution of a magnetic lead. So it looks this kind of rotating. And why it is so? It is because of the cross product in the equation. So when knowing this lead field, magnetic lead field, we take the dot product of the magnetic lead field and the source distribution and we get the signal in this lead. This equation is the same as in electric case. So this was the electric lead. We fed one unit current, reciprocal current to the lead, which raised here a field which is the electric scalar potential field and its negative gradient was electric field 
and because of the conductivity sigma, it produced a current field. And this current field was or is in the electric case the lead field, but in the magnetic case, that is not the lead field, it is the R cross B, the tangential field. I just summarized these equations here. Field as a negative gradient of the scalar potential of the reciprocal energization. Electric lead, the uh, field E sub L E is minus nabla phi sub L E. And similarly in magnetic lead, reciprocal magnetic field is minus nabla phi sub L M. Magnetic induction due to the reciprocal energization. This equation don't exist in the electric case. Magnetic field and magnetic induction is mu times h. Reciprocal electric field, it is that, that was the reciprocal electric field, but in magnetic case, the reciprocal electric field is R cross B, when that is a B, and the cross is here, 1 over 2 R cross B. Lead field, which is a current field, I said that I define that it is a current field, which is a lead field is sigma times electric field in electric case and sigma times electric field in magnetic case. And the detected signal when the reciprocal current is one ampere or in magnetic case one ampere per second unit current obtained with the integral of lead field dot source field and lead field dot source field. Just to say. So the trick in magnetic biomagnetism is this equation. Reciprocal electric field is R cross reciprocal magnetic field. The cross here is the trick. So this is how the lead field current density on the basic magnetic lead field looks like. It is uh, in ideal case it is rotating around the symmetry axis, its current density is proportional to the distance from the symmetry axis and zero on the axis and it is not the function of the distance in the direction of the symmetry axis. Cross section is shown here, I just show how the current is flowing around. <laughs> it can be shown also with the current density vectors of the lead field, they look like this. And briefly, you can we can say that here is a, a magnetic detector. Now it is a coil. We don't see the look the the, the disks anymore. We shi shift to a coil. It has the similar properties. Coil axis is here. The lead field current d is rotating around the symmetry axis. On the horizontal axis is a radial distance from the symmetry axis. On vertical axis is a current density. It is zero, the measurement sensitivity is zero on the symmetry axis. And when we go further away along the, from, from the uh, uh, symmetry axis, the lead field current density or the measurement sensitivity increases. Due to physical reasons, it of course does not increase to infinity when we go to infinity. It starts to decrease somewhere and the closer we are to the coil, the faster it increases. The further away we are from the coil, the slower it increases. That is the distribution of the measurement sensitivity. What do we do with biomagnetic measurements? The basic fundamental task is to find the magnetic dipole moment of the source. So the source distribution, source is distribution of Ji, current, uh, impressed current density, which is forming the volume source. Conductor, again, first is finite inhomogeneous. Sorry. No, we go to finite inhomogeneous. No, we are not anymore in infinite homogeneous. Sorry, we go to finite inhomogeneous. The magnetic dipole moment of the volume source is, by definition, is uh, 1 over 2 integral volume integral R cross J dB. That is the definition, mathematical definition in electromagnetic theory for a magnetic dipole moment. And the total current density was given earlier is impressed current density minus the return current. The magnetic dipole moment of the total source in 
finite inhomogeneous volume conductor, piecewise homogeneous, piecewise homogeneous volume conductor is moment is this one. And now we find the ideal lead field of a lead detecting the equivalent magnetic dipole of the volume source. We are now first in infinite homogeneous volume conductor. The relationship between magnetic lead voltage and the current source distribution is given here. I give quite quickly a few equations which you don't necessarily immediately see wh where they come from. The ideal lead field for detecting the magnetic dipole moment. The relationship between the lead voltage and the magnetic dipole moment is this one. And it indicates that one component of the magnetic dipole moment of a volume source is obtained with a detector which, when energized, produces homogeneous reciprocal magnetic field in the negative direction of the coordinate axis in the region of the source. So I went quickly here. Let's not spend too much time. You can find from the book in more detail. We need in the lead system, which detects the magnetic dipole moment of the volume source, we need three components, X, Y and Z components. In X component, the reciprocal magnetic field looks like that. And it may be obtained with this kind of double bipolar coil. Y direction, we need this kind of reciprocal magnetic field. It is obtained with this kind of bipolar coil and the same in z-direction. So if we have this kind of three uh, bipolar coils, bipolar gives better result than, than unipolar. With this detector system, we can detect the magnetic dipole moment. The one component of the lead system, the lead field detected the magnetic dipole moment in x-direction is this. In y direction, the magnetic lead field is this. And in z direction, it is this. And finally, combining these three, this is the measurement sensitivity distribution of a lead system, which detects the magnetic dipole moment of the volume source. I think you are happy that I did show the three components first before showing them all joined together. For instance, in magnetocardiography, the heart is in the center of the system. I show here the, the, the drawing of uh, Maurice Cornelius Escher, who is my favorite artist. Concentric rings, which is very similar as the lead field of the magnetic dipole moment detector. Synthesization of the ideal lead field for detection of the magnetic dipole moment. We first, we are looking now finite uh, the, the situation of the source is a volume source at the origin and the conductor is finite and spherical symmetric. What is the effect of magnetometer configuration and source size to the quality of dipolar lead field? This is similar business as I did show you in the electric case. Source is equal to magnetic dipole moment of a small and large volume sources. Conductor is infinite homogeneous. And as mag nodes, we have unipolar small coils, bipolar small coils, and bipolar large coils. Let's take first the unipolar leads, the small coils. We have the volume uh, conductor here, and we have x, y, and z directions, unipolar, small unipolar coils, and their lead fields look like this. If we have a small volume uh, source quite far away from the coil, the lead field is rather good in that region. But if the source is large, then the lead field is not homogeneous in the ideal case anymore. If we have bipolar lead, bipolar coils, then the situation is better for a small source and not so very good for large source, but much better than in the unipolar case. And finally, if we have large coils, then the lead field is more beautiful and we get much better result. So the message here is the same 
as in the electric case, detecting the electric dipole moment. If we have uh, unipolar detectors, the lead field is acceptable if it is the source is small and far from the detector. If the source is large and close to the detector, no good. If we have bipolar detector system, situation is much better. And finally, if we have bipolar system with large electrodes or mang nodes, situation is good. That is the message. How to get ideal coils, theoretically? Again, I show you something which our good friend Hermann Ludwig Ferdinand von Helmholtz invented. He invented Helmholtz coils. Are you familiar with Helmholtz coils? Who of you know Helmholtz coils? You are working in the Helmholtz Institute with... Okay, you know, thank you very much. Working in the Helmholtz Institute and you don't know what are Helmholtz coils. I teach you. <laughs> Helmholtz coils are a pair of coils whose distance is equal to the radius of the coil. And what is the idea here is, Helmholtz was a smart guy, believe that. The idea is that if you take these coils from that distance, closer or further away, both cases you get worse situation. This is the optimum situation where the magnetic field is most homogeneous here in this region. So Helmholtz was a smart guy. He just found that that's the case. So can we utilize the Helmholtz coils in detecting biomagnetic signals? Yes, we can, but that's not, that's not practically made. Those who are working with the squids don't, uh, don't uh, like this kind of coils because the coils are <laughs> larger, larger than the patients. But any, anyhow, uh, I'm speaking of the theory. When I wrote this book, I calculated these flux tubes and, and, and the fields for the illustrations in the book because I did not find from any reference source in the words libraries about uh, the, the fields of, of Helmholtz coils. Of course, someone had calculated, but they were not published. Today, you can easily, with a computer, just compute them. So these are the Helmholtz coils. You find that the flux tubes are very linear in this case, so that the, those are the coils. If you take the coils further away, it is not so homogeneous anymore. You easily see that. These are the isosensitivity lines for Helmholtz coils. Very linear, homogeneous. If you take the further away, not so beautiful anymore. So they are the Helmholtz coils, which are theoretically the best one. So this is the bipolar lead system for detecting magnetic dipole moment, having these bipolar coils. Why bipolar? Just therefore, which I did show you in the slides, that unipolar is possible, but bipolar gives much better result. In practical situations with these kind of coil systems, there are double coils, but that's another issue. They are used for compensating. Uh, noise from remote sources. Maybe uh, this is instrumentation. I don't speak too much about this. Let us discuss about the measurement sensitivity distributions and properties. Let's observe what are the sensitivity of the dipolar electric lead systems for radial and tangential current dipoles. Here is theoretically shown two electric lead fields, one in Y direction, homogeneous lead field, and one in Z direction. Here is a heart inside with red color is the uh, intracardiac blood. And this uh, uh, lilac violet is the cardiac muscle. If here is a current source dipole element in the radial direction, it is measured with X, uh, y lead and uh, Z lead and its components are here. The components of the signals, the components are here. 
And this is a tangential dipole source and its measurement sensitivity in Y and Z components are those. And it is given here and you finally find that in every location in the heart muscle, the total sensitivity of the dipolar electric lead system is the same for radial and tangential dipoles. So it is, electrocardiography is equally sensitive, the total sensitivity for radial and tangential dipoles. Of course, in every case, it is uh, uh, different for uh, radial and current uh, tangential, but if you sum up them, the total sensitivity is the same everywhere. How it is in magnetic detection? This is the sensitivity of the dipolar magnetic lead system. It is tangential everywhere. So magnet magnetic detection, like magnetocardiogram, detects only tangentially oriented source elements, only. So in ECG, it is detecting radial and tangential source elements equally. In magnetocardiogram, it is detected only tangential source elements. Now I ask you, how would look a lead system which detects only radial current sources, which are called radial cardiography? How would it look like? If you go to the shop to buy a radial cardiogram, they, they don't sell you one because they don't exist. But I just ask you, do you have any idea how to detect only the radial components of the cardiac source? The lead field must flow radially. It's not so difficult. You place one electrode with a catheter to the center of the heart and then electrodes all around on the body and the lead field is flowing radially. That's how it looks like. But you don't find such a device. But Always, every time when I lecture this, I say that I would like to ask someone to, to do a master thesis on this topic. I would like to see how the radial cardio electrocardiogram looks like. I would be very interested. I'm not sure if it has, uh, has clinical importance, but uh, one never knows. I tell you some special properties, further special properties of the magnetic lead fields. This is an important application, it's a really important application. In a spherical head model, the skull does not affect the magnetic lead field. This is fundamentally important. We have here a spherical head model. And there is the skull and inside is the brain region. We have the magnetometer, det magnetic detector here. It's symmetric line, the zero sensitivity line is symmetrical to the spherical model. The lead field of this detector flows everywhere tangentially. And the lead field current does not break or go through the boundary between the brain and the skull, and not the skull and the scalp. Therefore, it does not matter what is the resistivity of the skull, if its magnetic permeability is the same as space. Which means from the equation that this is the, the equation for the detected magnetic field, existing magnetic field, that term disappears. This is a nice example. When detecting the electric activity of the brain, with a magnetic detector, the high resistivity of the skull, which is a strong distortion producing element in electroencephalography, has no effect in the detection in magnetoencephalography. This is true, and this, I come to this, I come to this later on. This is true. And this was one strong argument in the beginning of biomagnetism research for application of magnetoencephalography. So I come later on 
to these issues, but I just mentioned now that I entered the field of biomagnetism in 1972, believe or not, 1972. And I remember these issues, they were exciting issues at those times, but I tell you some other things from, from these issues later on. Well, in spherical head model, the magnetic lead field flow, flow lines are oriented tangentially always. Also in the case that the detector is oriented in this orientation. The lead field flow lines go like this. And the zero sensitivity line, which is, was the symmetry line in, in the previous case, goes something like this and we can assume that it hypothetically goes in the space like that. So they go always tangentially, they never go radially, they do not have a radial component. Certain electric and magnetic leads are orthogonal. Assume this kind of basic electric lead. Here is a spherical volume conductor, homogeneous in this case. If we have a bipolar electric lead, the lead field looks something like that. You easily may just imagine how it goes. If we have a bipolar magnetic lead, the lead field goes tangentially like that. The zero sensitivity line is here in center. That's how it goes. Now, these two lead fields are orthogonal, orthogonal everywhere in the volume conductor. That is true. This was one argument in the early times of biomagnetism to claim that biomagnetic signals are complementary to the bioelectric ones. So that with biomagnetism, it is obtained information which is not available in bioelectric measurements and vice versa. And it was even believed, it was even believed that the amount of information in biomagnetic measurements is equally amount as it is in bioelectric ones. And it was believed that with, therefore, that with biomagnetic measurement, we get the same amount of new information as we get with bioelectric ones. And if that had been the case, it had been very great. But it was believed in the beginning. Now I ask, are the electric and magnetic leads in general, are they complementary? This is very simple. Assume that we have here, here is a spherical volume conductor to simplify it, homogeneous. There is one magnetic lead field flow line going here and one electric lead field flow line. And they are orthogonal in that point, just as I did show in the previous slide. If in this location is a source, electric source element, it is detected with the electric lead because they are parallel, but not detected by the magnetic lead. Looks very promising. If there is an other source element in the direction of the magnetic lead. It is detected with the magnetic detector because it is parallel, but not with the electric one because they are normal to each other. Continuously looks promising. So are they really fully independent, these signals? No, because most of the sources in this direction, uh, location, are oriented somewhere in between having component in the direction of the electric lead and in the direction of magnetic lead, <coughs> which means that in general, source in this location produces a signal both to the electric lead and to the magnetic lead. So the electric and magnetic signals are not fully independent, they are partially independent. I'm sorry for the colleagues who has, has spent millions of dollars and, and euros for biomagnetic laboratory, this is the case. Uh, we did, uh, in a very long time ago, just find 
how the distribution of measurement sensitivity of a coil behaves in a volume conductor. You understand that this is a water tank, this is a coil, and we just uh, measured uh, the, the measurement sensitivity. And there is a zero sensitivity line going something like that, which means that whichever source exists on this line, it produces no signal to the coil. And making the volume conductor a bit different, you find how it looks like. And when having it in this form, there are two zero sensitivity lines. Because the lead field current flows here in the one direction and around the other line in opposite direction. That's how it behaves. Now I discuss a little bit more about the independence of bioelectric and biomagnetic fields and measurements. I return to the equations of ECG and MCG. The activation, activating cells act as source elements which, with current density Ji, which produce two fields, which I did show you before. Equations of the electric and magnetic fields have two terms representing the source and the conductor. That I have shown you before. There are technical differences between ECG and MCG. I speak about cardiography, I will speak of encephalography equally well. In ECG, technically, there are needed electrodes on the surface of the body. In MCG, no electrodes, detectors are superconducting detectors. And because of the electrode contact potential fluctuations, the measurement of DC electrocardiogram is not possible. They are AC measurements. Don't go to the zero frequency. Because the magnetic detectors are superconducting, it is possible to go DC. These are just technical differences. I go to the theoretical differences. The, the theoretical differences come from the different kind of lead fields. In ECG, you remember that the flux source measurement is made with the system which has three orthogonal homogeneous lead fields, x, y, and z direction. And the vortex source, the magnetocardiogram detected with the detector, having three orthogonal tangential lead fields. What is the, how is the independence of bioelectric and biomagnetic fields? The fundamental issue in the clinical application of biomagnetism is do the biomagnetic signals include information which is independent on that of the bioelectric signals? If the biomagnetic signals do not have any independent information, then there are only technical reasons to use biomagnetism because it is so much more expensive. If they have independent information, that is clinically important. How much do they have independent information? That is a fundamental issue which we have solved. I discussed this issue through the Helmholtz theorem. Our good friend Helmholtz is again present. He was a fantastic guy. What is the Helmholtz theorem? There are different expressions to the Helmholtz theorem. The way I want to show it is this way which fits best to solve this problem. Mr. Helmholtz said that a general vector field which vanishes at infinity can be represented as a sum of two independent vector fields. One that is irrotational and the other one which is solenoidal. This is a very strong sentence. So Every physical vector field vanishes at infinity. So, for instance, the activity of the heart could be understood that it can be represented with the sum of two independent vector fields. One is irrotational and one is solenoidal. The independent sounds here very strong. These fields are Ji, the source distribution, total impressed current distribution, can be divided to two 
independent vector fields, the rotational and solenoidal. Sounds very promising. These are referred as flux and vortex sources. And just having a look to the equations of the uh, bioelectric signals, they originate from the flux source and the biomagnetic signals originate from the vortex source. Sounds very promising. This was the second argument in the beginning of biomagnetism. To believe that the biomagnetic signals on the basis of Helmholtz theorem are independent from the bioelectric ones, which we did show that they are not. What are the vortex and uh, flux and vortex sources? They are nothing uh, unique for bioelectromagnetism. They are universal concepts. For instance, if during the coffee break you just pour from the pot coffee to the cup and measure how much it is flowing to the cup, you are actually measuring one dipolar component of the flux source. If after that you take the spoon and stir the coffee and measure how much it is rotating, you are measuring one dipolar component of the vortex source. If you look the rapids of the river, the water which uh, part the, uh, the water movement when the water is progressing along the river, that is a flux source, and the water, it is in the rapids, it is rotating, that is the vortex source. Or in the uh, meteorology, the movement of the air or whichever. Uh, these are just universal concepts. Now about the independence of ECG and MCG. Robert Plonsi, my very good friend with whom I did write the book, published in 1972 in IEEE Transactions an article about the independence of ECG and MCG and he gave to the conclusion on the basis of the Helmholtz theorem that since the flux and vortex sources are independent, ECG and MCG are similarly independent. That was his conclusion. It was published in 72, that was the time when I was just working in, in Helsinki University of Technology in the uh, Low Temperature Physics Laboratory, we started to work with magnetocardiography. I remember personally how stimulating this paper was in the biomagnetism community. We really believed all that because Bob Plonsi is a smart guy, this must be true. And on that basis, whatever we measure with magnetocardiogram is independent from electrocardiogram and we get the same amount of new information as is, was obtained with ECG before. Very stimulating for the research of biomagnetism. <coughs> then 1974, I moved to Stanford University. Uh, I made my thesis there. I was from 74 to 76 at Stanford. And at that time in 75, Stanley Rush, who is another smart guy, uh, published in the same journal, Transaction Biomedical Engineering, another article on this topic. And his conclusion was that the independence of the flow and vortex sources is only a mathematical possibility. The flow and vortex sources are one to one with each other, which means that they are, they are connected to each other. So this was very confusing. One fellow said that the ECG and MCG are fully independent and the other fellow said that they are fully interdependent. It was very confusing for the biomagnetic community. And it was practically, it was found that when the, uh, looking the ECG and MCG, they, they are somehow similar, but there's some differences. So what is the solution for this? The fundamental controversy in this issue is solved in the following way. This is my, my solution to the problem. On the basis of the Helmholtz theorem, the electric and magnetic lead fields are independent, not the electric and magnetic signals. So the source distribution, the, the sensitivity distribution of electric and magnetic fields, the lead fields are independent. 
But as I did show before, the electric and magnetic signals are only partially independent. So on the basis of the Maxwell's equations, the total electric and magnetic fields are interdependent, not their dipolar components. So Maxwell was a smart guy as well. So if you know the total electric field, on the basis of Maxwell's equations, you are able to calculate the magnetic field. And if they are possible to calculate from each other, they are fully interdependent. So what is the situation? The trick is that when making the measurement of the bioelectric field, like the field of the heart, we are not able to measure the total field. We usually measure the dipolar component. And from the dipolar component, from the electric field, it is not possible to calculate the dipolar component of the magnetic field. But if we know the total electric field everywhere in the space and also inside the heart, from that information, we are able to calculate the total magnetic field, which means that the total field are interdependent, but for instance, the dipolar or quadrupolar components are partially independent. That is the solution. So let's still have a look to the lead fields detecting electric and magnetic dipole moments. So the detection of electric dipole moment of the, the flux source, as I showed you before, is with a lead system which has three orthogonal linear lead fields. Sensitivity is homogeneous. And the flux or uh, vortex source, the magnetic case, with three orthogonal tangential lead fields. Sensitivity is proportional to the radial distance from the symmetry axis and is always tangential. These three lead field elements are mutually independent. What it means? It means that you are not able to synthesize one of these lead fields as a linear combination of the two other ones. So these three electric lead field components are mutually independent. Same holds in the magnetic case. You are not able to synthesize one of these components as a linear combination of the two other ones. What Mr. Helmholtz said, on the basis of the Helmholtz theorem, the electric and magnetic lead fields are mutually independent. Therefore, none of the six components of the electric and magnetic lead fields is a linear combination of the other five. This is what Helmholtz said. They are the lead fields, the measurement sensitivity distributions, which are independent. The detected signals are only partially independent. So I'm very happy to tell this to you in the Helmholtz Institute. So this is a nice place to discuss this. I think I should show this before, but I show it again. So this is a universal issue, not only in the bioelectromagnetism. Uh, Though we live in a three-dimensional world, we have six dimensions of freedom. So I show you this skater. The skater may glide in the direction of the x-axis. Or skater may glide to the direction of y-axis or rotate uh, or jump in the direction of z-axis. In all these cases, when moving in the direction of one axis, every cell of his body is moving in the same speed to the same direction. And this is true, but not the whole truth. The skater is also able to rotate along the x-axis, around the y-axis, and around the z-axis. And when rotating around one axis, for instance z-axis, every cell of the body of the skater is rotating around the symmetry axis with a speed which is linearly proportional to the radial distance from the symmetry axis. So, the first case is the flux, uh, analog with the flux source, and the second case with the vortex source. So, 
the Helmholtz theorem, it is universal. It beautifully I is seen in, in the theory of electromagnetism or bioelectromagnetism in this course about the flux and vortex sources. But it holds similarly with the fluid dynamics. In the meteorological pro process, you see the movement of the air. In the movement of, of the uh, mechanics, in the movement of the skater or whichever, it is a universal mathematical uh, fact. What Mr. Helmholtz invented. It's great, fantastic. Still, something about the interdependence of the total electric and magnetic fields. If we know the electric field totally, we can calculate the total magnetic field through the Maxwell equations. For this, we need infinite number of measurements, including inside the source, just as I said. In practice, we can make only limited number of measurements and get to know only part of the electric field, usually the dipolar component. From this, we cannot calculate accurately the dipolar component of the magnetic field. Therefore, measuring the dipolar magnetic field gives new information about the source. It is partially independent information. This is history. I gave in, in Estonia, in Tartu, uh, in, in uh, I think it was, yeah, it was in 1994, a course, this same course, bioelectromagnetism, it was much, much more different at that time. I very much was thinking about what is the independence of bioelectricity and biomagnetism. I gave this kind of graph to, to, to show my thoughts at that time. They were not so clear at that time. I thought that there are a group of butterflies, blue and yellow butterflies flying, and they are people having sunglasses, three people on the X, Y, and Z axis having yellow sunglasses and another three people having blue sunglasses and, and they are partially seeing spark of the butterflies going they, that is partially independent so this was kind of kind of illustration about about the independence of bioelectricity and biomagnetism this is not of course but this is a one step forward before i found the final solution which i gave to you but this is historically in interesting and, and nostalgic for myself personally at least I show you some information about the sensitivity distribution of the basic magnetic leads. Well, it can be calculated with, uh, easily with equations found from the book, the lead fields, what is the field induced by a coil in certain circular paths. Uh, this I did show you already before. I repeat that if we have one single coil on the symmetry axis, the lead field current density is zero. It is tangential everywhere around the symmetry axis and increasing as a radial distance, this is a magnitude, radial distance from the symmetry axis. On the level closer to the coil, it is stronger, rising faster. On the level further away from the coil, rising slower. And we can draw here isosensitivity lines in the space. That's how it behaves for a single coil. Isosensitivity lines are here. Uh, okay, this analysis I do not show you too much more here. That's how it behaves. That was a general analysis about biomagnetism. I will speak you in more detail after electroencephalography, I speak to you about magnetoencephalography. And after electrocardiography, I will speak to you about magnetocardiography. So you find what is the combination and, and, and connection between bioelectric and biomagnetic fields. But I still have six minutes time, and I start to speak about electroencephalography, which is the next topic. Electric and magnetic measurement of the electric activity of neural tissue is uh, part four. Electroencephalography. It is found a very ancient historical so-called Edwin Smith surgical papyrus. The first documented reference to the nervous system, 3500 BC. There was the first use of the word brain. You can easily find it from here. That is the brain. That's it's shown better. 
Uh, there are a lo lot of interesting experiments on the detecting of the electric activity of the brain. I do not go through, of course, all of those. I just mentioned briefly Richard Caton made the first recording of EEG from rabbits and monkeys, not on the scalp, but he placed an electrode inside the brain, into the brain. Adolf Beck recognition from e recording EEG from rabbit and dog, uh, several, several experiments, interesting experiments. But the most famous in this field is Hans Berger, who made the first recording of the human EEG on the scalp of the patient. These are the words, first electroencephalograms from the page of his notebook. He was very optimistic, he was a psychiatrist. He was very optimistic about the possibilities to be able to read from the EEG how the patient thinks. And we still share his optimism on this issue. That, that's a bit too difficult issue, we cannot do that even today. So here is Mr. Hans Berger. He was nominated for Nobel Prize in 1940 for the development of the Elocard encephalogram by Walter Cannon, but he did not receive the prize. He did not win the prize, but he was one of the, uh, of the nominated uh, persons, unfortunately, because he had certainly earned that. Uh, here is a uh, psychi psychiatric uh, clinic in Jena. He worked in Jena in Germany. And this is a picture from his EEG laboratory in 1932. What kind of generator the brain is, electric generator? He, here is a frequency spectrum of a normal EEG. You find that there is a dominating frequency at 10 hertz, which is alpha rhythm coming from the uh, uh, back of the head from the occipital region, and that comes or exists when the patient is awake and closes the eyes. When opening the eyes, there's coming so much information to the brain that the dominating alpha rhythm is disappears. But what you see here that is that from the scalp EEG, the frequency band is below 50 hertz, the power of the uh, recording uh, decreases fast, at about 50 hertz, you don't find anything. Here is the same issue as a logarithmic scale. In clinical application, the basic standard lead system is so-called 1020 system, so-called Jasper system. This 1020 system is a, is a, is a good standard. It is the electrode positions are easily found so that it is first found the point nation, which is here on the root of the nose, and then inion on the back of, of the uh, head. You may just try with your finger, you find a bump here on the skull. It is easy to find it. And this line from the nation to inion is divided 100% and taken the points uh, at 10, 20, 20, 20, 20, and 10 percent distances. On that line, it is placed the electrodes. The same is done at 10, 20, 20, 10, 20, 10 on horizontal orientation from the level of the first electrodes. And in the cross of these lines, cross points are located the electrodes. This 10, 20 system was uh, standardized uh, by the committee uh, headed by Jasper, Herbert Jasper, and that was, the, was taken as a standard. And this is the picture uh, of produced by the committee. And this picture you find from every basic electroencephalography textbook. It has a lot of historical uh, importance. But there is a fundamental mistake. I did lecture bioelectromagnetism at, at least 15 years without finding the mistake. I found it when I draw the illustrations to my book. I, I drawn all illustrations in my book by my own hand. I enjoyed it very much. And when drawing the illustrations, I found that, wow, there is a fundamental mistake. And what is the mistake? 
The electrodes should be on the scalp, but they are drawn on the cortex. So to be able to do the measurement of the cortex, one needs a trepanation, drilling 20 holes to the skull. So why are they on the cortex? Of course, the person who has drawn this illustration uh, has uh, from this found that they are here, the electrodes, and thought that they are not on the scalp, thought that they are on the cortex, and drawn the other electrodes here on the cortex as well. So that's such, such happens. Well, sometimes it is fun to found, find uh, fundamental mistakes in the colleagues' uh, scientific works, but I am afraid that they are finding fundamental mistakes from my works as well. But anyhow, that's how it goes. It's surprising that the mistake exists in all the books of electroencephalography. If you go to see it. Now it is just a quarter to twelve. I think uh, this was enough fun and we can just stop the lecture to this point. See you next week. Thank you very much.